So welcome everyone. I'm Sarah, I'm the engineering lead for TensorFlow Lite, and I'm really happy to be here talking to you about on-device machine learning. And I'm Jared, tech lead on TensorFlow Lite, and I'm reasonably excited to share with you our progress and all the latest <laughs> updates. So first of all, what is TensorFlow Lite? So TensorFlow Lite is our production-ready framework for deploying machine learning on mobile and embedded devices. It is cross-platform, so it can be used for deployment on Android, iOS, Linux-based systems, as well as several other platforms. So let's talk about the need for TensorFlow Lite and why we built an on-device machine learning solution. Simply put, there is now a huge demand for doing machine learning on the edge. And it is driven by a need for building user experiences which require low latency. Further factors are poor network connectivity and the need for user privacy preserving features. All of these are easier done when you're doing machine learning directly on the device, and that's why we released TensorFlow Lite late in 2017. And this shows our journey since then. We've made a ton of improvements across the board in terms of the ops that we support, performance, usability, tools which allow you to optimize your models, the number of languages we support in our API, as well as the number of platforms TensorFlow Lite runs on. TensorFlow Lite is now on, deployed on more than 3 billion devices globally. Many of Google's own largest apps are using it, as are apps from several other uh, external companies. So this is a sampling of apps which use TensorFlow Lite, Google Photos, Gboard, YouTube, Assistant, as well as leading companies like Hike, Uber, and more. So what is TensorFlow Lite being used for? So we find that our developers use it for popular use cases around text, image, and speech, but we are also seeing lots of emerging and new use cases come up in the areas of audio and content generation. So this was a quick introduction about TensorFlow Lite. In the rest of this talk, we are going to be focusing on sharing our latest updates and the highlights. For more details, please check out the TensorFlow Lite talk later in the day. So today, I'm really excited to announce a suite of tools which will make it really easy for developers to get started with TensorFlow Lite. First up, we're introducing a new support library. This makes it really easy to pre-process and transform your data to make it ready for inferencing with a machine learning model. So let's look at an example. These are the steps that a developer typically goes through to use a model in their app once they have converted it to the TensorFlow Lite model format. And let's say they're doing image classification. So then they will likely need to write code which looks something like this. As you can see, it is a lot of code for loading, transforming, and using the data. With the new support library, the previous wall of code that I showed can be reduced significantly to this. Just a single line of code is needed for each of loading, transforming, and using the resultant classifications. Next up, we are introducing model metadata. Now, model authors can provide a metadata spec when they are creating and converting models. And this makes it easier for users of the model to understand what the model does and to use it in production. Let's look at an example again. The metadata descriptor here provides additional information about what the model does, the expected format of the inputs, and what is the meaning of the outputs. Third, we've made our model repository much richer. We've added several new models across several different domains. All of them are pre-converted into the TensorFlow Lite model format, so you can download them and use them right away. Having a repository of ready-to-use models is great for getting started and trying them out. However, most of our developers will need to customize these models in some way, which is why we are releasing a set of APIs which you can use to use your own data to retrain these models and then use them in your app. We've heard from our developers that uh, we need to provide better and more tutorials and examples. So we're releasing today several full examples which show code not only how to use a model, but to how you would write an end-to-end -end app. And these examples have been written for several platforms, Android, iOS, Raspberry Pi, and even Edge TPUs. And lastly, 
I'm super happy to announce that we have just launched a brand new course on how to use TensorFlow Lite on Udacity. All of these are live right now. Please check them out and give us feedback. And this brings me to another announcement that I'm very excited about. So we have worked with the researchers at Google Brain to bring mobile BERT to developers through TensorFlow Lite. BERT is a method of pre-training language representations, which gets really fantastic results on a wide variety of natural language processing tasks. Google itself uses BERT extensively to understand natural text on the web, but it is having a transformational impact broadly across the industry. So the model that we are releasing is up to 4.4 times faster than standard BERT, while being four times smaller with no loss in accuracy. The model is less than 100 megabytes in size, so it's usable even on lower end phones. It's available on our site, ready for use right now. We're really excited about the new use cases this model will unlock. And to show you all how cool this technology really is, we have a demo coming up of mobile BERT running live on a phone. I'll invite Jared to show you. Thanks, Sarah. So as we've heard, BERT can be used for a number of language-related tasks, but today I want to demonstrate it for question answering. That is, given some body of text and a question about its content, BERT can find the answer to the question in the text. So let's take it for a spin. We have an app here which has a number of pre-selected Wikipedia snippets. And again, the model was not trained on any of the text in these snippets. So now I'm a space geek, so let's dig into the Apollo program. All right, let's start with an easy question. What did Kennedy want to achieve with the Apollo program? Landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. OK. But everybody knows that. Let's try a harder one. Which program came after Mercury, but before Apollo? Project Gemini. Not bad. Hmm. All right, Bert, you think you're so smart. Where are all the aliens? Moon. There it is. <laughs> Mystery solved. Now, all jokes aside, you may not have noticed that this phone is running in airplane mode. There's no connection to the server. So everything from speech recognition to the BERT model to text-to-speech was all running on device using ML. Pretty neat. <laughs> so now I'd like to talk about some improvements and investments we've been making in the TensorFlow Lite ecosystem focused on improving your model deployment. Let's start with performance. A key goal of TensorFlow Lite is to make your models run as fast as possible across mobile and edge CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and NPUs. And we've made many investments across all of these fronts. We've made significant CPU improvements. We've added OpenCL support to improve GPU acceleration. And we've updated our support for all of Android Q and an API ops and features. Our previously announced Qualcomm DSP delegate targeting mid and low tier devices will be available for use in the coming weeks. And we've also made some improvements in our performance and benchmark tooling to better assist both model and app developers in identifying the optimal deployment configuration. Now, to highlight some of these improvements, let's take a look at our performance just six months ago at Google I.O. using MobileNet for classification inference. And compare that with the performance of today. This represents a massive reduction in latency. And you can expect this across a wide range of models and devices, both low-end and high-end. Just pull the latest version of TensorFlight into your app, and you can see these improvements today. So digging a little bit more into these numbers, floating point CPU execution is our default path, and it represents a, a solid baseline. Enabling quantization, now easier with post-training quantization, provides three times faster inference. And enabling GPU execution provides yet more of a speed up, six times faster than our CPU baseline. And finally, for absolute peak performance, we have the Pixel 4 Neural Core, accessible via the NNAPI TensorFlow Lite delegate. This kind of specialized accelerator, available in more and more of the latest devices, unlocks capabilities and use cases that just a short time ago were thought impossible on mobile devices. But we haven't stopped there. 
Seamless and more robust model conversion has been a major priority for the team, and we'd like to give an update on a completely new TensorFlow Lite model conversion pipeline. This new converter was built from the ground up to provide more intuitive error messages when conversion fails, add support for control flow, and for more advanced models like BERT, DeepSpeech V2, MaskR CNN, and more. We're excited to announce that the new converter is available in beta and will be available more generally soon. We also want to make it easy for any app developer to use TensorFlow Lite. And to that end, we've released a number of new first-class language bindings, including Swift, Objective-C, C Sharp for Unity, and more. This complements our existing set of bindings in C++, Java, and Python. And thanks to community efforts, we've seen the creation of additional bindings in Rust, Go, and even Dart. As an open source project, we welcome and encourage these kinds of contributions. Our model optimization toolkit remains the one-stop shop for compressing and optimizing your model. There will be a talk later today with more details. Check out that talk. So we've come a long way, but we have many planned improvements. Our roadmap includes expanding a set of supported models, further improvements in performance, as well as some more advanced features like on-device personalization and training. Please check out our roadmap on tensorflow.org and give us feedback. Again, we're an open source project, and we want to remain transparent about our priorities and where we're headed. So I want to talk now about our efforts in enabling ML not just on billions of phones, but on the hundreds of billions of embedded devices and microcontrollers that exist and are used in production globally. TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is that effort. It uses the same model format, the same conversion pipeline, and largely the same kernel library as TensorFlow Lite. So what are these microcontrollers? These are the small, low-power, all-in-one computer computers that power everyday devices all around us, from microwaves and smoke detectors to sensors and toys. They can cost as little as 10 cents each, and with TensorFlow, it's possible to use them for machine learning. ARM, an industry leader in the embedded market, has adopted TensorFlow as their official solution for AI on ARM microcontrollers. And together, we've made optimizations that significantly improve performance on this embedded ARM hardware. We've also partnered, partnered with Arduino and just launched the official Arduino TensorFlow library. This makes it possible for you to get started doing speech detection on Arduino hardware in just under five minutes. And now, we'd like to demonstrate TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers running in production. Today, if a motor breaks down, it can cause expensive downtime and maintenance costs, but using TensorFlow, it's possible to simply and affordably detect these problems before failure dramatically reducing these costs. Mark Stubbs, co-founder of Shoreline IoT, will now give us a demo of how they're using TensorFlow to address this problem. They've developed a sensor that can be attached to a motor just like a sticker. It uses a low-power, always-on TensorFlow model to detect motor anomalies. And with this model, their device can run for up to five years on a single small battery using just 45 microamps with its Cortex Ambit Cortex M4 CPU. So here we have a motor that will simulate an anomaly. As the RPMs increase, it will start to vibrate and shake, and the TensorFlow model should detect this as a fault and indicate so with a red LED. All right, Mark, let's start the motor. OK, so here we have a normal state. And you can see this. It's being detected with the green LED. Everything's fine. Let's crank it up. It's starting to vibrate, it's oscillating. I'm getting a little nervous and frankly a little sweaty. Red light, boom. Okay, the TensorFlow model detected the anomaly. We could shut it down. Halloween disaster averted. Thank you, Mark. So that's all we have, folks. Please try out TensorFlow Lite if you haven't already. And once again, we are very thankful for the contributions that we get from our community. We also have a longer talk later today. We have a demo booth. Please come by and chat with us. Thank you.